Welcome. This is the November 1st Jalen Zones call. So far, we have Entreneg, Pat, Jamie, Dan, and myself, Michael. Perhaps others will trickle in. And Pat is a new attendee who is using Elixir and is relatively new to FreeBSD. Pat, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Hey, everybody. Pat, uh, like Michael said, I work as a developer for a company called Ratio, and we build software systems for public health organizations. And we've been using Elixir to build these systems for the last few years. Uh, and a big part of our model is um, building and running the software. And so we wanted to make sure that it was reliable and easy for us to manage as we have a whole bunch of uh, different systems we run. And as, as Michael said, as I'd been seeing kind of the I don't know, modern deployment techniques and just going crazy with how complex it was. So that got me back into free BSD. And um, so I've been, we've deployed a few systems on that for about a year and a half or so. Um, those have since been decommissioned. And so now I'm mainly using it as my development environment, which has been nice because I can kind of do some more R&D for things that we'll do in the future. And I guess the small thing I want to say about jails briefly is, you know, uh, there's a product called TailScale, which provides WireGuard based VPNs, and they just announced a really new fe uh, feature that you can switch from one. So if you have a personal one and a work one, you can switch between the two, which is a feature that I've had uh, for about a year and a half on FreeBSC. And I actually have both running at the same time because I have a personal VPN in, in one jail and a work VPN in another jail because each one has their own network stack. And so I can just do that. I don't have to wait for them to build it and let me make me switch. So um here to just kind of learn, see what people are up to, and uh, get to meet some people and hang out with fellow nerds. Thanks. Welcome. And are you using, say, VNet or an ePair and friends for those jails, or something more mundane? With uh, yes, exactly. Oh, cool. VNet and ePair. And is there a, a yeah, blog so post hiding in that? Uh, I do have a little YouTube video that I can find. That oh, I'll drop the link in. in. The, um, yeah. Uh, I'll drop the link in Slack. Fantastic. One of the key rules here is, yeah, have your links handy because it's probably something cool that everyone else wants to hear about. Cool. Yeah, I forget exact. I wrote that. I did that a while back, but I will put together, if it doesn't have quite that information, I will put that together. I know that it talks about FreeBSD or tail scale on FreeBSD. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's like hosting like a private thing and just kind of locking down the IP. But I will share something about like uh, tail scale in a jail too separately and having parallel tail scale networks running. Tail scale jail. Excellent. Uh, have you done just the one project with Elixir or do you have quite a few under your belt? Uh, yeah, we've built, I think I've worked on five different projects using Elixir. Some of them back to back, some of them in parallel, but five different systems that made it out to production. Cool. Uh, I don't want to make this that into an Elixir call, but uh, go ahead, Antrenig. I heard you interject. No, that was Dan, I think. Uh, Dan. Hello. If, if this has already been covered, have you told us what Elixir is? Oh, it's a uh, Elixir is a programming language and it runs on a platform called the beam which comes out of, which is what erlang runs on and so elixir is a very nice syntax uh over a nice syntax language on the beam and i don't know enough about erlang to tell you the specific um any specific functionality that elixir adds i think most of the functionality comes from the beam and, and elixir is just kind of What's that? Uh, I'm saying indeed. Can I give the marketing version oh, of sure. that? Absolutely. Yeah, Elixir is a programming language platform to uh, uh, to create software systems as as systems as in plural, not in singular. If you think LS, that's a software, that's a system software, that's a single one. Elixir is for when you have thousands of these things and they all need to work together. So telco massive infrastructure. Basically, the biggest mistake that Kubernetes did was using Go. They should have just went with Erlang or Elixir. 
Are there some killer apps? You yeah. Share? You mentioned Telco. Yes. Uh, killer apps, that includes the uh, Ericsson uh, telecommunication software that they run on basically every uh, LTE uh, antenna that you see on the street. That's one big one. And from the open source side of things, there is um, uh, Plausible, which is a Google Analytics alternative. Uh, that one is written in Elixir. And there's also, of course, there are a lot of the, uh, uh, there's CouchDB, that is a NoSQL database, oh, also yeah. on FreeBSD. Yes, CouchDB. Mm-hmm. And also, I'm guessing, so yeah, the RabbitMQ, RabbitMQ from the, from the, uh, uh, for, for the MQ family of protocols, there's also RabbitMQ. And there's also a lot of other software that runs on uh, um, Erlang, Elixir, uh, the, the whole OTP open telecom platform. On the whole open telecom platform, there's a lot of them. Um, so, yeah. Well, well, and the, the, there's I've a... never heard of that. Do you have a link for yes, it? Yes, yes. That, uh... uh, that, that's, that's, that's like the Erlang library. That's like the, wow. that's like the STD of Erlang. STD as in standard, you know, not not as in. Yeah. No. Oh, yeah. um, What's the spell of standard? What? <laughs> uh, it's the standard development tools of Erlang. It's called OTP, Open Tele, Open Telecom and Platform Toolkit. Okay. I yes, uh, indeed. And uh, and uh, there is also a FreeBSD Erlang team, by the way. There is Erlang at FreeBSD org, which uh, manages all the Elixir and Erlang ports uh, in uh, the programming language themselves, as well as anything related to that. So RabbitMQ. Uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. Yeah. yeah the, yeah, the, and the, I, I would say the, the the sort of main feature that we care about in elixir is concurrency it's a excellent platform for building concurrent systems and getting visibility into them and it does process management so that you can we were talking about this a little bit yesterday michael that you design the supervision trees and so if something fails it's able to isolate that failure and just kind of restart it from a clean state. Um, And then also sort of visibility. Um, And an example, we had some bug over Christmas holiday, but we were able to log in and actually connect directly to the VM because it's effect beam is effectively a VM um, and it's running in. uh, So we're able to connect to that and inspect the state of the application as it's actually running in there and not like kind of looking what's in the database, but like what are the actual data structures in memory at that point in time? And so we're able to figure out what the problem was and fix it and go back home, uh, you know, pretty quickly. So it also um, works well for distributed systems. And so those are kind of like concurrency and distributed systems and just being uh, very reliable for building concurrent distributed systems is the kind of the main selling point of the beam as far as uh, my experience. What's the license of the underlying code? I don't know. Um, I don't know. Yeah. In I would guess MIT Apache 20 probably. Okay. Yeah. I, MIT Apache 20 probably, but yeah, quick Google. We'll it's find out, right? Yeah. Easy to answer. Yeah. Easy to answer. And you had me at MIT. Uh, other observations on this uh, lesser known yet seemingly very powerful ecosystem. And Antrenig, is one of your products built in Elixir or Erlang? And you are muted. Yeah, I'm back. Uh, yeah, not yeah. All of my products are actually the commercial ones are all in um, Elixir because my team has an Erlang background. We used to use Elixir before even it was it was version one point basically. Uh, like we're talking where it was still using eighty percent of the Erlang semantics because Elixir at the end of the day is just a syntactic sugar on top of Erlang. It it doesn't do anything. You know, like it's not a it, 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 yeah, I, I think that's the nice way of putting it. It is just, it's, it's like a lot of syntactic sugar on top of Erlang, basically. Uh, but we were using it like when still 80% of the language was Erlang itself. So we we're very, very young adopter, early adopters of Elixir. Uh, we also publish um, our software in the, you know, the Elixir um, package manager that they call it HexPM. And um, the interesting part of that is that the Erlang takes care of 
Um, FreeBSD has a tier one platform, unlike many other uh, programming languages. Like they do run their tests on FreeBSD to make sure that like that it's not like a second class citizen there. It's it's always running in there, including Dtrace support. Oh, so uh, the, yes. go ahead. Yes, the the Erlang VM. Uh, which is called Beam, does have integrated support with Dtrace. It runs on the Mac on FreeBSD. And I think I've even seen it on QNX, actually. Blackberry's QNX uh, as of uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and it, 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 it has its hooks. Uh, it all works perfectly. Basically, you can trace the Erlang kernel itself using Dtrace. Uh, it, it also gives the ability to expose... Uh, Elixir and Erlang built-in and made functions to FreeBSD via Dtrace. So uh, what we call a um, user-defined uh, probe, you can define those in Erlang as well. And this is all part of the language itself. Like it's not like an afterthought or anything. Like it, 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 it gets tested with every release. Uh, people use it on production because there's a massive Erlang deployment on Solaris uh, because of telco companies. Hmm. Uh, so the, 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 that's why I said like one of the killer features. Mm, I think they also added lately support for the Linux -y stuff, eBPF or SysTrap or whatever, but Dtrace has been there for a very long time. Jamie, has it crossed your desk over the years? You're muted for what it's worth, but hey, I'm just cornering you. There is a link. Ah, I noticed I was on mute. Uh, no, it hasn't. Um, I I don't really uh, have much to do with uh, programming languages that aren't C, though, I have to admit. <laughs> That's okay. C rules the world, runs the world, rather. Love it or hate it. Cool. Um, Other topics, and uh, thank you for the links. I can't change focus to Zoom. It just won't let me in my little la that laptop here. I will try again. Um, Antrenik, do you have a report on your work with myself and Jan that is specific to jails? We've been covering a lot of territory and process uh, supervision, which came up in the last little section. Yeah, so I made a POC. Hopefully, I will have time to demo it tomorrow, but I can't promise. But it is in the roadmap of, well, first of all, Michael's idea was to change the thing that we showed last week, which was called SVB Hive, because it runs Beehive on top of Run It SV. We renamed it to Super V for uh, very obvious reasons. Uh, we named it Super V, and now Super V can uh, run. There's a POC where now it can run. Um, uh, beehive VMs inside of jail. Uh, so jailed beehive, basically. As far as I know, other automated tools don't do this. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I haven't seen it for no, sure in VM beehive. Yeah, correct. Yeah. yeah. So uh, th there's a big advantage. Obviously, on the other hand, we're a very you know young tool, not a mature like VM beehive that does basically everything, including networking, right? So there's also that. Um, so jailed beehive is is on the way. If not tomorrow, then definitely I'll demo it next week. The way it works is very basic. It runs the uh, jail command manually, creates a jail with the path that it needs to do to do, and um, after that, uh, well, it does actually create a full jail. For, uh, just FYI, and after that, it will uh, use the devfs rules in order to allow the specific VMMs and the specific tap interfaces inside the jail. So it's not like we're using allow VMM that shows all the VMs that would be, well, I mean, it's a good feature to have, of course, uh, but security wise, it yeah, might be good to allow each VMM. Nuke your peers, no worries, no worries. Um, welcome, Jan. Uh, did you get any applications yet under that framework like Samba or otherwise or not yet? That's next in the future. Um, well, it, it can run FreeBSD. Um, that's enough. pretty much all I have right now. Uh, but I, yeah. And, uh, but that's, I mean, Samba has to run on something, right? It has to run on FreeBSD VM or on a of something course. else or like but Windows. It's the supervision that's exciting here, especially after that uh, introduction to Elixir. <laughs> oh, right. Um, 
So yeah, not not in super V. Super V only supervises the beehive processes. Got it. Uh, also, when there's a when it's a jailed beehive, it just monitors the beehive. If it dies, it restarts the beehive, including the jail itself. So, but it yeah, could supervise yeah. dream, other components. Yeah. I take it. it uh, could it supervise other components? I think that's Jan to answer. He knows okay. that code much better. I mean, hi, um... hi Jan. Hello. Couldn't make it earlier. No worries. Uh, uh, so, um, Super V, what is that? That's the scripts that you wrote, and then I converted it into a repository. Uh, so it's it's run it plus scripts to manage Beehive. Okay, yeah. Um, so run it can supervise anything which does uh, not uh, demonize. So if you configure can configure it to uh, stay in the foreground, then you can supervise it. Interesting. Which is almost every server software these days. The problem is sometimes the opposite. For example, nothing written in Go can demonize itself and always needs some kind of wrapper like the base system daemon or some other tool. Um, run it only supervises processes. So if you want some side effect to stay around after the process exits, run it can't uh, just doesn't cover that use case. The Ugly rock around you can do is mm -hmm. end with an infinite sleep loop. Uh, just if ever you're woken up, you go to sleep again and you s try to sleep till the end of time. Um, but that's a really ugly rock around. Um, if you want that look into S6RC, it does it the right way. Does uh, OpenRC handle it the right way? OpenRC is not a supervisor on its own. On its own, yeah, but it's just what the RC.d scripts do, just with a bit more bells and whistle. Okay. And yes, you could use, run, for example, run it to as part of the service startup. Busy. Well, you would do something like do the. Uh, Jails, uh, just you could just use the jail dash c command and have a jail start action which does not uh background itself. So you run something in foreground, then yeah, that kind of works. A better way would be to use the run script to set up a persistent jail and then use jxec because the jail command does run even the start action as a child process, which is not what you want uh, because of signal delivery and so on. Um, instead, it's better if uh, you set up a persistent jail as part of a run script and then in the run script, it's the last action you, action you end the shell script with exec, j exec, and then the command invocation. But for that to work, you have to set up the JLS persistent so that it doesn't get garbage collected in between by the kernel, which is totally doable and works reliably. So that's no problem here. But uh, you could, for example, use it to run uh, Samba in a jail without Beehive. That is attractive. And it looks like maybe Europe, you had daylight savings time. I apologize for that. And you described late yesterday a your use of dot include or yeah that's out. something else which i wanted to share now that i have it okay. then, any questions for jan through. to date on process supervision or shall we wait till on further along okay well go ahead and tell us about your clever use of the dot include feature before it's even hit official release So, um, Antonik, are you done? Or do you have more? Well, you always got more. <laughs> I, 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 I don't, honestly. Hopefully, I'll have some better demo tomorrow for the Super V stuff. 
and maybe next week for the GLB Hive stuff. But I do have a, a question for uh, Jamie, which is, Jamie, do you think we can have something like allow.vmm or rather vmm equals a vmm's name and only that would be exposed to a jail does that make sense because a lot of vmm is exposing dev vmm and everything inside of it um right jamie do you want to answer that uh is, is that really a jail question or is it just a um dfs question yeah uh so the problem is that um, the VM basically. So you have the DevF. You have to have a DevFS mount point inside the J, mm -hmm. and you have. So you have to have this DevFS mount point. But the problem is that there is no good way to dynamically allocate DevFS rule set numbers. So unless you go with hardwired jail IDs and hardwired numbers. You can't really have dynamically instantiated uh, rule sets, but you don't have to have them because you can also just start out with the basic jail uh, rule set from the example on a mount point and then allow only the additional devices. The other complication is that uh, for if it has a directory like with VMM, you have to unhide the directory and the content and unhide everything. So basically, what you do is you unhide the directory, you hide everything in it, you unhide the one device you want in it. This is how you have to set it up. I can mm -hmm. pick out an example. So uh, the pro what this would require if, the, if it were to be baked into the jail command, for the jail command to basically not just pass through the rule set number to the mount uh, invocation or to the end mount system call directly, but instead to um, also use the devfs octals or go to the through the devfs command to uh, modify the rules for the jails mount point. But you can also do that from the pre-start hook. Yeah, that sounds like something that would probably be best left in the pre-start hook rather than and become a jail feature itself. Yeah, that's how I did it. Just push it into pre-start. But regarding pre-start, I've encountered an interesting problem with uh, VNet and, and um, the created hook. There's no way basically to do some interface configuration um, once a jail has been created. So there's nothing between basically created, then the interfaces are moved from the uh, host to the jail, and then there's no hook. Once this is done to do some pre setup in there, you have to immediately go into start, which on one hand, yes, but there's no nothing you can, there's basically pre start is too early, then created, and you have nothing to do something after the devices have been moved the network interfaces have been yes moved it seems the like the more features stack. sorry uh, go on so there's one point basically which you can't really hook in the host that's after created and the interfaces have been moved but before start because start is inside the uh, jail and post start is after start okay. and yeah yeah, so too late. It seems like every time the jail does something automated, there's somebody who wants a hook before that and after that. Yeah, <laughs> it's a lot of hooks. Totally. Yeah. So I, of course, I just worked around it by creating my interfaces in the created, move them over myself, not add them to the vnet.interface list, and then I can do the do this step myself. And yeah, is that relatively clean to do it yourself? Um, it's easy, but you are at that point, it's not a big problem. It's just that you have to basically bypass a bit of the automation, which is already there. It's not hard to do. It's like five lines of shell more, but it's, it's something the jail command can't know and so can't undo correctly. So you also now have to do basically, uh, and, uh, exit trap in your shell script to clean up. I see. Uh, okay. Yeah. 
It sounds like Pat has a Postgres in jail question. Maybe, Jan, we can do that before you dive into dot .include. Sure. Are there any Postgres users on the call? Yes. Me. Conference organizers? <laughs> no, not anymore. Not anymore. Oh, darn, we missed it. Like Moby is free. Jeez. Moby is free. Thank you. Uh, uh, Pat, describe your question. I'm sure we have an answer within reach. Yeah, so I have two, but we'll talk about Postgres first, which is just, I'm curious if anybody has a working config for Postgres in a jail. And I ask because I know that uh, Postgres requires IPC and there's some setting to allow IPC on a per jail basis, but I've yes. never successfully gotten that work. So I wonder if somebody Search has a bare blog. bones Postgres in a jail. Search my blog dan.langel.org you'll find postgres in a jail cool thank just you um, works. so i can play the world expert thing. go ahead Pat? special but you you'll find it in to... there and oh sorry need to contact me email um pat one thing to look out for is that you probably will run into a lot of outdated overcome warnings which are no longer relevant the reason for that is that the system five IPC mechanisms used to not be jail aware. Uh, this has been fixed, I think, in nine or 10. So uh, it's Ten. an old yes. problem we no longer have. So now you can uh, decide if you want to uh, disable a system five IPC per mechanism. So uh, IP messaging, uh, New Texas and semaphores or something, uh, um, queues and some, yeah, and uh, you can decide if you want to not disable it. If you want to pass through the host's uh, context unmodified and unprotected, or if you want to create a new subcontext, uh, and that's probably what you want to do these days. And the other thing is that Postgres no longer uses. System 5 IPC as much as it used to. Um, yep. Um, so you can also, the allow IPC is uh, just the pass through mode, the legacy behavior which uh, exposes all System 5 IPC to the jail, which is normally not what you want. Right. Are you saying, is uh, it what, possible? What you to want is to. IPC for Postgres entirely? Hmm? Is it, are you they, saying, is it possible to disable IPC for Postgres entirely? No, because they <laughs> still use it as far as I know, because it's a robust uh, lock to prevent you from starting uh, Postgres twice uh, and having two Postgres master processes to uh, just uh, turn your uh, database uh, into data remains. <laughs> Nicely put. Um, so you want to set all of these uh, three to uh, like equals new, and then the jail is no longer an additional complication inside the jail. It will just work as if you are not jailed without you uh, having to worry about it from the, the host point of view because it's just a sub namespace. So yeah, not no collisions. All the all, if you see anyone mentioning having to uh, pick a unique Postgres uh, user ID and group ID for each Postgres server jail on a host, you know that we're talking about the bad old times. Gotcha. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, I have seen the allow sysv IPC config and yep. for whatever, I will, I'll follow up. I'll try, you know, I'll try it again and follow up if I, I'll follow up with whatever I find. So the idea is that you just use the, this um, to uh, get, um, yeah, to just okay. get System 5 IPC for the jail of its own. And it just works. You no longer have to worry about being in a jail. It's just out of your way. Fantastic. Did you have a second question? I do. So one thing that I have wanted to do is define a config file that has multiple jails in it. And uh, last time I tried it, 
can't do it. So like under etsyjail.conf.d, it's possible to define multiple jails in etsyjail.conf, of course. But if I want to extract, say, three of those into one file, so these jails all go together and I want them in one file, then jail only looks at like the jail name. It'll look for a file that has that name, yes. but you can't put multiple jails in one file. And I'm wondering, Can... I would like I would like to be able to do that. You can, but you have to mm -hmm. hard assuming them uh, so into this, each of the names. What you can I... blame me for that. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm the person who broke that, and I'm not very sorry, because it was a legacy issue. Uh, so, no, to, to bring the background of the issue, we have to understand that there are two parts involved in this. There's the jail command, and there's the jail service. Uh, when you use the jail command, as in the jail 8, you can do whatever you want. But when it's the jail service, it's it was for historical purposes, it was built in a very opinionated way. Uh, I actually don't know who original author is, but I'm sure it's not in the room here because I've seen that Jamie only did the tool and the config part. But the, 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 the script is very complex, as in the JLRCD script. So, yeah, I know I can do git blame, but apparently I'm going to start to blame a lot of people, including myself. So git blame was not a good solution there. Uh, okay, so the problem with the jail RC script is the following, is that if you give it a specific jail name to boot, let's say dub, 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 zero, it means it's going to go and look for either the jail dub, 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 zero in Etsy jail.conf or in Etsy jail dot dub, 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 zero dot com or in Etsy dot uh, sorry or in etsy jail.conf.d www.conf right but the problem is that it executes the file with the parameter of the jail name so it will say dear jail utility here is the file that you're supposed to use it's called it's at etsy jail.conf dot d dub 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 zero dot conf and here's the jail name that you're supposed to boot which is called dub 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 zero and it will end up doing that however if you want for example in my infrastructure i do actually do that uh, there are the, you can just um either use depends in the single file so if you have dub 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 zero in a single file um and inside that file you have two other jails, let's say DB0 and API0. The, the, the dub, dub, dub zero jail can have depends uh, on the other two jails. So now they will start automatically. That's one option without modifying anything in the system. And the second option, which I prefer more, but you could break some things if, if you don't know what you're doing, is that you modify the RCD jail script on your system and you remove the place where it passes the jail name to the jail command. So now it will parse the file and run everything in it, every jail that exists in that file. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. That's super helpful. The depends is interesting. So it, you know, one thing with that is I don't think you're not able to then say restart uh, one of the dependent jails. I don't know if that even makes sense because you probably want to restart everything. But I'll do. I'll do that. I'll try depends and that probably solves the problem. It sounds like, you know, what you're saying is the, 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 the service script is passing the file and the jail name. And so if I wanted to do what I'm saying, uh, a change would be to have to let the service script accept some optional parameter be like, Hey, th this is the, the config is my network and the specific jail to operate on is the jail name, right? So giving it two things, like the name of a config and the name of mm -hmm. the jail. Um, maybe is a possibility, but I'll do the, the depends. I didn't think of that, and that makes sense. So yes. I will try that. And, uh, well, thank you. Um, Pat, uh, do you use anything to manage your FreeBSD jail hosts? If you use something like Ansible or Salt, you can use them to assemble a single jail configuration file for multiple snippets. So uh, in, uh, for example, Ansible, that module would be called assemble. I don't, I'm sure other tools have the same functionality for, to concatenate configuration snippets into a single configuration file. Uh, it's a bit annoying to use, and uh, but it's what is already available in 14. Dot includes solves all of this. 14 includes salt? 
no, no it includes uh, include. We'll get to that in just a second. Oh, 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 sorry. Uh, it's sorry, a new sorry, feature, sorry. and it's probably very new to you. It's been a hot topic here. Antronik, you gave a bunch of syntax. Is this helpful, do you think, to uh, that role? Oh, yeah, it's a Postgres, so... Uh, this is for the Postgres. Um, no, I, uh, I think Jan's, Jan's option is better, which is to yeah, visualize... The, VIPC yeah. is dangerous. You don't want to set that. That bring basically just does not take advantage of uh, virtualizing uh, a system five IPC. Instead, it just uh, exposes the host system five IPC to the jail, and that's uh, the state we were in the uh, previous D eight or so. Uh, it's there for compatibility. It's don't use it. Uh, I lose this example unless you really have a very niche use case where you may want to let's say have. Two sub jails for services using System Five IPC. I, I'm not familiar with anything where this would make sense, but yeah. You, okay, you is this could do that. example helpful, or should I remove it? Uh, it is a useful example. The okay, other cool. part is why would you uh, burden your database with uh, VNet? Yeah. Okay. Um, and but... why would you do it this way? Uh, that's the other question I have because uh, you don't have to inject the routes using start. You can, the cleaner way to do it would be to use uh, the created to inject the sys, uh, use sysrc to inject the configuration into etcrc.conf and then run the normal rc scripts, basically update the configuration and then let the startup scripts take care instead of running handful commands to do some of the network configuration just treat it as a FreeBSD system. Well, and, there you uh, go. Pat, uh, Pat, I will update the jail wiki today uh, or whenever 14 comes out. Technically, I don't want to publish it sooner because we still don't have versioned handbooks. Uh, that's a story for another day. Uh, yeah. As soon as the 14 comes out, I will write an example oh. of how to use the includes with depends properly because every user, I, I get an email like once a month that someone complains that because of my change for adding support for jail.conf.d, their depends is not broken. I'm like, and I have to explain, no, no, depends, I did not break that. It was broken since day zero, like since that code shipped. Historically, um, it was always broken. But now with the includes, it's completely now uh, easier to manage. And we'll, we'll write an, an example on how to do the depends and the includes together properly uh, on, 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 the, on the systems running 14. So cool. Thank this you little, um, regarding the problems of having uh, static EPS and so on. I've written this little MKE pair script uh, in response to last week's call uh, because it came out often enough that people have run into this and not uh, made use of renaming interfaces and stuff. So Do you have a more permanent spot than a gist in mind? Or I see uh, if I the not name. yet. Uh, it has a path, but it's also a gist, but it's also a thing. Okay. Yeah, well, it's uh, it's just that that's just so I don't lose it. Uh, that's okay. Fair enough. <laughs> I'll grant you that. Um, well, great. Keep, keep Godspeed on that. So, um, as you can see, uh, oh. um, let's let me fill in this link. Um, if you open that. Uh, one sec. You get the usage output. You know the second link. Yeah, I see it. I'm, I'm, just trying, I'm trying. I'm trying. Sorry. No, I'm kidding. Sorry. Uh, I have to drag Windows to make it work and not go too crazy. Okay, so you have uh, usage. Awesome. Just one second. Yeah. Do, 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 do. That's just the usage output uh, without the. Boom. So the There's usage the uh, explains how it works. Uh, so if you just invoke it, it will just create a new uh, e-pair. But you can also assign names to both ends. You can uh, assign MAC addresses to either end. You can have it move the e one or both sides of an e-pair to a jail. Uh, put them as a member on a bridge, which must already be uh, there for it to be added. It does not create the bridge implicitly. Uh, assign one or both ends to groups 
and you can also use it to basically run uh, an IF config invocation in the right jail um, on the right interface. So that you don't have to repeat yourself and you assign the name multiple times and, and so it just basically does the right thing in a with proper quoting so that it's reliable even if you're crazy enough to put stupid characters in your uh, interface names or stuff like, yes, I want an interface named space tap new line. And poo emoji, uh, yes. That is yeah, that's fantastic really work. Thank you so, so much for that. And I do hope it formalizes over time. I have a question. Clearly a need for all these helpers. Go ahead, Jan. Um, I, I have a question. Yeah, please. Yes. I, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, so my question, my question is, uh, well, to the people here actually, uh, what's the longest name of a jail that you have? And the reason of my question is, I was thinking of using a Jan's script in a jailer. Uh, so the 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 interface names would be like EP or EB that rather dash the jail name dash one a one b two a two b regarding on how many interfaces that it has, uh, but that means I'm limited to the number of the characters of a uh, uh, of a interface which is currently sixteen uh, characters, and that means if your jail name is long and it, the first part is repeatable, I might have problems. So if it was like dub, 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 zero, and then the same with one, that it might end up with the same, you know, name, and that might have a crash. So I'm just wondering, what's the longest name of a jail that you've seen in production? So I've seen people putting fully qualified to main names in there and the type of jail it is. So basically, jail type dash or underscore and then a fully qualified domain name, however long it is. Okay. Which is the, easily longer than the easily. 15 yes. minus the prefix or suffix. Uh, agreed, or agreed. Agreed. Okay. Yeah, for 15 maybe we should uh, ask if it's part, what would be the downside of raising IF name max uh, to at least 64 maybe more. Thank you. Um, if anyone has any experience with that, I'll also be very... Oh, um, because my, my problem is that inside of the jail, I want to have a static interface name because now it's... Well, in jailer, it's not all auto-generated every time, as in you wouldn't um, see a jail with an EPR zero now and EPR one tomorrow. It will always stay the same number. But I, I would prefer mm -hmm. if it was a little more identifiable. And yes, Jan, I do use the description field. And the, oh, uh, right, setting the description field isn't something I've put in there. I've only put in groups. So maybe one more pair of flags. But um, the problem right now is that, for example, you can't have the same interface name on uh, two jails uh, with renamed interfaces. I think you still have to be unique across all VNets on the host. At least not in the parent, so between parent and jail. I don't know within a jail, but yeah. It is gets that a security issue? The problem is if a jail gets destroyed, the parent uh, gets the interface back. Can you, can, I mean, could that be like an enumeration attack? Wait, that's very yeah. fascinating. Like if, if you break into a jail, and you start renaming the interface, or rather, yes. let's say you create an interface and you put you it. You can't rename it and name it EM0 because then it gets uh, the rename will fail. The kernel will not allow you to do that. Which means I can like know the name of the interface of the host uh, if, if it yes, refuses. Yes, you can probe it. What do you mean I can probe it? You have to guess. You can oh, okay. only try to rename and get a new name in use back. Oh, so, so that's a very interesting enumeration attack that someone could use, for example, to know the uh, identifiers of the interface names on other jails. I mean, I, I, I would assume it would be a very complex attack to have a use of that information, but the fact that, that it's enumerable is it's very interesting. At least I hope... You have an Oracle error... attack, but that's all. It's only uh, possible to probe if the name exists, not um, do much with it. Okay. 
So you need a lot of other bigger problems of for this to be a, a part of a, an exploit chain. Yeah, and I have nine, own, nine problems, but the naming is not one of them. Okay, got it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. Okay, point of order. Antonig, what was the name length question you had? The jail name itself? Or... Um, the, the, yeah, the, the length of the name itself. Okay, uh, the, this is a query to know if jailers should use jail names in the interface names, and turns out the answer is no. So thank you, Jan. Okay, anything else before an introduction to include... From what you can do and what you can ahead. use yep. if you create the interface in the created hook and move them over yourself, which brings up the topic I mentioned earlier, is if you do that, then you could use the jail ID, which is short into the point, and rename it to ePair jail ID, maybe even interface inside the jail, just use this small number as part of your uh, name scheme. Uh, can, can jail A and B have the same interface name inside? Like, can jail A have... I think they can. Yes, they can. They can. Yeah. Yeah, so what I do is I rename I rename the B end of an e-pair to e-link when it's Always. in the jail. So every one of my jails. So the host will be like jail 1A. Is what it's going to be called, and then, okay. or maybe it's just jail one. But then, in every jail, the interface is called eLink. In every jail, the interface is called eLink. Always in every jail. Uh, yep. What's the process of that? You create the eLink, and then it passes. Uh, would you have problems if you're starting the jails concurrently? I so I think Michael posts. So I shared a link to the little script that I used to set that up. And oh, yeah. then I think Michael dumped the code in here. But if you look, there's, I just linked to, uh, if you look at the be comment that I left, it's on Pat Maddox, right? Yep, that's um, that's how I do that. Yeah. Here's that. Not sure about that. starting things concurrently, like you said. Okay. But, okay. Because if you notice, like, so down, it renames things. That what's one thing that bugs me, right, is that you can't name uh, e pair right off the bat and get a and b right you have you name it and it'll uh -huh. give the a name but then b is still going to be you know e pair 3b so you have to rename it so you get that yeah. but then if you notice there in that if config i just rename it to e link uh -huh. um, the jail that that's a very cool idea because I, I my problem was never on the host side of things that part is very much like manageable but the guest is always a fresh free bsd i don't have much control after it boots so if i want to use something like dhcp i have to guess the name of the interface inside so i have like my own tiny algorithm right now so uh, don't for, have uh, to uh, guess. Uh, yeah no I, I mean i have to like send it inside the jail with crc to be like oh there's this interface assign this hard-coded mac address and then but it would be nicer if like every jail had hey Healing, the HCP done right. So that would if be I a remember lot. Remember correctly, yeah. you can also using somewhere in the networking script there is auto magic to configure interfaces by MAC address. I don't know the exact syntax, but it's there and it's useful for things like a dedicated server you rent at some hoster for things uh -huh. like deep ingrination to basically. You assign the default interface and so on by a MAC address or a default Ethernet interface. There is support for this it, hidden something where in etc uh, network dot subro, but I haven't had to use it uh, in a long time, luckily. Yeah, no, network dot is a uh, is uh, is is the definition of the word legacy. So. So there's one, one thing I just want to point out with that thing that I shared, because I haven't seen it. I, ha I haven't seen it described elsewhere. And I've found I really like it is the idea of configuring a lot of stuff in the jail from the host before it boots. So you see there, like I'm modifying the, I'm, I'm modifying the RC file on the jail mm -hmm. from that host to the alias yes. for sysr. And I do a similar thing. So like, you know, the name servers, right? I don't want to, I don't want to have to log in the jail and configure the name server. The host knows what the name or server should be. And so I've used that with jails. I've used that with um, Beehive too, where 
when, when the beehive shut down, I mount it to a path on the host and then I modify the files there and then I unmount it and give it back, you know, start beehive again. So this kind of, there's some things that the guest should manage, but there's some things that the host should manage. And because we're just modifying config files, I can do all that from the host before it boots. And I think it's really cool. Now, the idea that you're using e-link inside every jail opens a lot of possibilities that uh, from a jail management point of view, it, 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 it's going to make things a lot easier as far as I can tell. Uh, the reason why I asked about the concurrent thing is that uh, I just couldn't, because I'm sorry, I am on my phone. My apologies for that. Is that are you are you renaming on the host and then passing it to the jail, right? Yeah, exactly. That's just right. that's a few lines up. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's just that, that, that it, during the concurrent start, that could be a that problem, be a, but I don't think it, it, well, it matters much for you. So not per, I don't I don't think it's a problem because it gets renamed to Elink within the guest. That's the thing. On the host, it's going to be called like Jail One A, Jail One B, and oh. then the host passes Jail One B to the guest, but then it's in the guest's RC comp that it gets renamed to Elink. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, it would be so nice to have a stable name if that's supported before the rc.d script to use. And that basically be set up on behalf of the jail by the host. So that the created hook is the right place, in my opinion. Uh, you could just use it uh, to... Um, Create the interface, and then the once the created hook is executed, um, oh wait, you could even make it easier. You put it, you assign an interface name to uh, vnet dot interface, a single one. Um, then you use the um, gel to create that. But the problem now is that yeah, you it has to be host wide unique, but at least it's known in the gel dot com. So. You can just put it in and then it won't change every time. And it could be derived from the jail name. So it could be something like epair dash jail name or something. Well, that gets us back to the name length limitation. Welcome, Daniel B. Uh, can we revisit okay. a previous topic ever so briefly? Oh. Well, so. Uh, Daniel B, I believe you're the author of, was it, uh, Netgraph Net Buddy and you have make EI face and I dropped him a link on Jan's new ePair tool and you were wondering if they should, uh, join each other and become friends. I guess the bridges would they, there would be different kinds of bridges but i could make something that works exactly like this and that would be um that could be that could be useful to insert into a jail uh jail con or something yeah, that was my intention for this to be used from jail con host hooks either uh, pre-start or created jan were the bridges on your radar uh, bringing up the bridges, no, I assumed that you would want to have a static set of bridges, or at least not use jail.conf to also create bridges, uh, because otherwise you have a problem that you have to connect the bridge to the outside world unless you want a, a purely jail-only bridge where the which is not connected to the outside world. That can be useful, but it's a special case. Uh, so I assumed that you pre-create the bridges in rc.conf uh, and use uh, netif uh, and bridge and the other related uh, rc.d scripts to create the bridge. And then you run the jails once the bridges have been created. That's, yeah, that's why I don't use Devin Teske's uh, scripts that, that come with uh, free example scripts that come with FreeBSD because they do have they do have bridge management. It is it's it's very smart. It's it's very well implemented. Um, 
but I prefer my bridges to be static as well. Go ahead and connect offline as appropriate. It sounds like you're both like attacking the same thing. And I very much want to see an ecosystems of these little helpers because there's so much housekeeping that's been re 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 reinvented by projects. So thank you both. It would so be much. also uh, ideal if after you guys marry your tools, I guess, we could also drop it into base, just like uh, Devin Tesca's scripts are in there. Because honestly, uh, Devin's are very advanced and people who uh, use them know why they're using them. But the utilities that you have are way more, let's say, beginner friendly that can uh, uh, be a lot, a lot useful for newcomers who want to try out jails compared to the utilities okay. that we have now. There is no reason why you can't have a fancy rd rc.d script which also handles setup. It's not that uncommon for some ports to basically have a setup or similar uh, command in the rc.d script, let's say PostgreSQL and initDB. And you could have found something similar for ePairs where you would basically update rc.conf using sysrc or something. And then write it yeah, back. But that gets us into uh, the bike shedding discussions of whether RC.D script should do such a thing or if it's only a hack which can't be prevented. Yeah, that's what my <clears throat> that's what my quote unquote buddy does. And then that means that it's probably not useful for most people because it handles all of the all of the the, the bridge and complex networking setups mm -hmm. uh, on, on RC. And the point is for me that I wanted to boot up and do that, but it would be much better to do it more Unixy in individual bits that, you know, do a really good job at making a bridge when they start up and really good job at making an um, a VNet interface when the jail turns on. That would be, that's probably where I'm heading. Um, the place to create the VNet interface dynamically is the created uh, book. Yeah, um, agreed. Because that runs after the jail has been created, but before the interfaces are moved. So if you create it there uh, and it has a static name on the host, uh, then you can create it dynamically, rename it, and the jail uh, command will then uh, assign it to its VNet. And things will just work. Oh, uh, well, mm -hmm. Patrick and Chris. And someone needs to mute some aspects. Oh, Patrick, right. you can no worries. Logging in with the second device. Yes. Okay. So I was worried we'd have two Pats, two Dans, two Chris's, you name it. Uh, Chris, welcome. We have covered a lot of territory, but we're about to jump into an introduction to the new include feature to our new attendee, Pat. Uh, Chris, do you want to briefly introduce yourself? And uh, is that a topic that interests you? Uh, so we only have a good one, Pat. Hey, so I'm Chris. I'm uh, definitely interested in everything jails and beehive because um, Originally, I came to the calls from the Enterprise Working Group, and I'm uh, doing my best to uh, bring jails and beehives together also in the interest of enterprise stakeholders. I'm volunteering for the uh, FreeBSD Foundation together with uh, Greg Wallace. And um, whatever you guys were talking about, I'm definitely interested in it. So fortunately, it was a whole bunch of details in the weeds that uh, we're rounded off with a bunch of helper scripts and questions about merging them or at least unifying them and making them compatible. So good stuff is going on. Uh, feel free to read along what we've done so far and I will get the recording out pretty soon. Uh, that said, anything else on those topics or should we get uh, the dot include intro out? Yeah, I just remembered one topic I yes, wanted sir. to bring up, especially now that Jamie is here. Um, that, that is, um, once we have some way to uh, keep not just the jail parameters, but also the jail variables, 
or something like it inside the kernel. I foresee one interesting use case for this to uh, reserve some part of the node space if it's hierarchical or not, uh, or a prefix or whatever convention you want to use as a way to basically have hooks of your own to manage the running J. Like if I have a service, let's say, uh, write freely or next cloud to do the initial first start setup inside the jail or to set an administrative password or add a user to a service and register this kind of API endpoints basically so that I could basically have the jail be not just a passive thing but something you can invoke commands on which the jail configuration defines. An example of, of that, because I'm not quite getting it. So the idea would be to either store uh, some kind of script in a variable. Uh, let's say I have something like uh, cmd slash uh, set password, and then if such a variable exists, and you can then basically do something like jail um, run, co run command, and then name of this variable, and then the shell script gets executed, the host, and it can do things uh, with the jail. That sounds like a user. So it's something that would not be used at all in jail creation. It was. It's just something associated with the jail for some later okay. use. Yeah, to make the, it possible to for a j jail configuration to define um, commands to invoke on the jail while it's running to, as an example would be to reset the admin password of a web UI or something or create the first user of on a service or something. Isn't that purely a user that, land question within the jail? Yeah, that sounds kind of out of scope of jail.conf. The idea of the here is to put it in jail.conf because, uh, or to make it available for the, through the jail command so that basically you could inspect the state and would have a convention to observe instead of tagging this on yourself. Hmm. Because I see a lot of busy everything where you have these kinds of um, jail template mechanisms, they need something like this. Be that uh, uh, cursor uh, free NAS uh, outdated jail collection or uh, something like Bastille and so on, all of them need something like setup and management. If you, let's say you want to run. Uh, small Java server and want to add users and so on. Let's have a convention on how to have the, the host call upon a modification on the jail. Could hmm. you make a just a uh, proof of concept of what you think that would look like and then we'll just take it in the future? Take it yes, and cool. it's not, uh, and given how long we will have to wait for the kernel side of this to and make it into base, it's not anything time critical. Yeah, so uh, for 15, think about super early, like right now about what that might look like, but it sounds a bit early to be actionable by the rest of us, <laughs> to be to put it super politely. <laughs> well, it is, but it... Okay, of the three of you, Jamie, Antrenig, and Jan, who wants to give a quick crash course on include for those who celebrate, especially Pat, who's new to us. So I have an example to uh, usage to share. Great. Go for it. Would you like to share your screen or drop in another gist? Or no, no, I will just uh, take the screen over if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, sure. And this is the uh, include for jailconf and what, what FreeBSD version does this apply to? Uh, 14 and you are. Got it. Uh, it's going to be legendary. <laughs> So uh, let's just make sure this looks to be the right window. Yes, I think so. Is that a reasonable size for everyone? Yes. 
of a uh, font size or should I resize for window? So um, this is my etcjl.conf. which says if there is a user local etcjl.conf, then include it. If not, the glob doesn't match. It's not an error to not match for a glob. So it's basically a try include. Then it includes everything from etcjl.d star.conf. So everything which is not a hidden file and is uh, in user, uh, sorry, etcjl.d and ends on .conf gets included. And in all directories, all the jail.confs get also included. So if you have a complex jail, which needs a bit of companion files to go with it, you create a directory for the jail and name the jail.conf jail.conf in the subdirectory. So let's say you have long hooks and you don't want to put them in a jail.conf because then you have to double quote the shell script. Instead, you can put the shell script in a jail.sh or something uh, and source it from the jail.conf. I can share an example to make it clearer later. And the same for user local etc jail.d. So now let's have a look what I... Mm -hmm. So this gets included everywhere, basically. The storage pool, that's my NAS, and it's on the SSD pool, okay. Uh, the data set that I want my jails, basically all rooted in slash jails, my domain, okay. Um, then the path is just this path slash the name of the jail, the data set, and so on. And a helper to export a bunch of variables. That's the problem. Configuration variables in uh, jail.conf aren't exported as environment variables and as such are unavailable to uh, the hooks directly. So I have to basically have a variable containing the shell code to export the variables. And I don't care about better quoting than this because uh, this is a configuration file only writable by root. If you put shell uh, quoting attacks in your own configuration files, that's on you as root. Okay. Um, Pat, is that making sense? So um, now. Uh, yeah. Sorry. I just, um, so I think this ans this covers exactly what I was asking earlier with multiple files, given the include. The question I have that I want to see is, how it handles variables in any of the later configuration files. Um, it handles them as if you wrote them into a single file. Okay. And the include is done as a very early via the uh, Lex parser script. Basically, Lex uh, opens the file, uh, recurses down it, and has a recursion limit so that you, if you have a cyclical include, uh, once you exceed the maximum recursion depth, it aborts with an error uh, before it runs out of stack space. And I think it's, I don't know which level Jamie committed, either 16 or 32 or something like 32, that. 32, I think. Yeah, that should be uh, Lots enough. Of <laughs> uh, so um, what I do here now, let's say the 14 uh, RC3. My jail.conf to define the base jail, okay. Uh, it includes uh, using a relative path, so base.conf, okay. Base.conf defines a bunch of variables and then includes this here. So I'm doing fa fairly involved trickery here, okay. So let's have a look here into the shared part. So this here is basically the base part. The idea is if you want to base a jail on this using advanced ZFS cloning magic, uh, or black magic probably, given how easy it is to get yourself into trouble doing that. But um, you can do it. And then you would include this here, the 
you would include, for example, this if you want to base your jail upon this so that you have the variables available. And the, these basically are variables derived from these assignments. It's basically just concatenate the strings to build up the right values so that I don't have to repeat myself there. Huh? But uh, the jail.conf includes this jail.conf here. And this jail.conf then does, oops, Uh, does this here define the right prepare and release hooks? And the prepare basically goes here, exports the variables so that they are available as exported shell variables. And then it sources this shell script here and runs this for function. Hold so up. let's um, say, yep. Could you get back to that, please? Okay. I use dot Wait. to source. No, no, please, please, I have a question. When yes. you say export host, what is that doing? Mm. That's from... The, the line that says, yeah. See, it's a very complex deal, so it's difficult to get my head around the simple things that are happening. Exactly, okay, that's so it's the problem. That. Okay. It's exporting yeah. all the variables assigned here and the name. Yeah. Right. Okay. And the, so I just have to build a bunch of export right. lines to make all the variables available. I understand that. Back back to the jail. Back to the previous file, please. Is he? I'm sorry. Yeah. And then export base is a very similar thing. Okay. Ex now, uh, base uh, this year. Export yes. base, uh, that's in defined in base.com, which is yeah. this year. But, but it's a very similar, very similar. It's the thing. same thing. It's just a bunch of uh, okay. regex generated repeating assignments. Basically, yeah. every assignment I do up here, I repeat down here. Uh, and it's just export variable name equals single tick dollar variable name single tick. It's okay. repetitive and nothing more. Yeah. Back back to the other back to the jail definition. Yep. I hope so the real jail definition happens um, for example here. So this is the, the per jail jail.com. And it includes in it includes into the jail block. So it opens up a jail. And it has to do that because you can't use a variable name uh, to uh, in a jail.conf. So jail names aren't expanded. You have to use a literal here. Otherwise, I could have a single shared jail.conf. But not, because of that, I have to have a, a unique trivial jail.conf, which then includes all of its content. But the oh, Basically, jail name, open braces, uh, content, closing braces has to be there for each jail because I can't uh, abstract over the jail name. I can't use something like, this isn't uh, allowed. I can't have a variable reference in a jail name. Syntax does not allow that. So um, once I do this, I, I get my base jail. So let me just do that. And do I still have it yet? So um, no, okay. Um, so the, the base jail is just, uh, if we look at it, ZFS list. Uh, <laughs> um, yes? All the output that was produced there, is that a result of FreeBSC 14 or a result of your this shell scripts? This is my shell yes. scripting. Okay. Uh, so, um, 
Okay. Um, did I really put it out there? Let me check. Uh, yep. So yeah, I put the JLT. Okay. These are now. Let's have a look here at this data set, for example. And you see, it's only a snapshotted read-only data set. The uh, interesting part is I then go ahead and build this up, clone it, but clone it read-only, because the problem with ZFS clones is that you can never rebase them. So basically, when you take a snapshot, clone it, and modify the clone, the changes are locked into the clone, and now you uh, have basically two diverging branches of your uh, once nice deduplicated jail. And you can't really get the content out of this clone uh, without destroying that. <laughs> so yeah, that's the problem. So I can't have any uh, persistent changes to clones if, because the only way to update a clone is to destroy it and create a new clone. And that's a problem if I have persistent data in there. So I avoid ever having persistent data in a clone. I do that through a, a bit of file system layout trickery, uh, which can get quite confusing. I hope I can get it across. Uh, what I'm do doing is, um, first of all, I build up my packages to install. So uh, let's say I want to have an ARIA download server. And I have this jail.conf, which does the same thing. Uh, it just uses the same shell script for each hook on the host. And it only has prepare, common, and so on. The same thing we've already seen. But what's interesting is that now uh, I have this non-trivial shell script here, which does the output you've asked about. Here's the function. And it makes sure to find all mount points uh, under the jail uh, root directory and unmount them. It does this by uh, invoking mount-p uh, using a function using only built-in so that I don't fork off sub-processes to process a kilobyte or so of text and finds any path which is either exactly the jail path or the jail path slash and some wildcard. If so, it keeps them and the filtered FS tab is piped into umount-f uh, to uh, unmount them all. So that uh, basically whatever is mounted in the jail uh, subdirectories gets unmounted. And then I build up a clean structure of mount points again. So here I check if my base is on a state. OK, let's uh, destroy that. Last uh, Oh, I think I shouldn't destroy them while the jail is running. That would be a bit messy. Hey, it's a live demo that goes with the territory. Oh. It would be interesting. I'd watch that. Yeah. And I've so, dropped a link in chat uh, to a call where Jan described his layout on the data sets. That's tip of the iceberg. So now I have to stop the relevant parts. Now can I can destroy. So da -da -da -dum, uh, yep. yep, I have to be one more level more of aggressiveness. And then 
So now I have destroyed all the jails and all of the data sets. Let's see if it all still works. Now I use a package base to uh, install the base system uh, to get a snapshot I can later clone. It takes about a minute with a fast uh, package service because it uh, has to process three and a half gigabytes of compressed tarballs writing lots of small files. But that's a local cache. Yeah, it's from a local cached. But the slow part is basically uncompressing the uh, TAXZ archives and then writing them on an LZ4 compressed uh, data set. And FreeBSD 14 is a bit bigger than 13 because Clang and LLVM got even fatter of and bl course. more bloated. Like plus, so now yeah. we, so we have our base jail. Now I can create. It installs a bunch of packages and takes a snapshot again. And this is a version which installs even, even less. Okay, this is all of the boring setup work. And the interesting part is that now I can create my instance of that. And it failed. Why did it fail? That's not good. It's not supposed to happen. Okay, the what is are your ZFS? Well, it's a very good taste of it. it looks like a, a ZFS command failed there. Um, uh, yeah, what? Uh, okay, I'm, I can fix that once. Uh, there's a bug. In my set script, I know, but that would take too long. Yeah, uh, I will just manually fix the problem. Now it should just uh, start. Yep. But uh, the interesting part is that uh, I've provisioned the whole jail, did the network configuration in less than a second. And no, if I now go, but no, I don't invoke package anymore per jail. I only invoke so... package to set up the base system at the package set. Once they're okay. created, it's all ZFS commands. Is that in some way a golden image reference jail? And these uh, this is based yeah, on? Yeah, they aren't really complete jail. They are components which are then reassembled into a complete jail. OK. But okay. yes. Cool. And the nice thing is, so here, no, destroy it. Could and... a series of helper scripts make this uh, a little more mortal friendly? Here's the directories that, that make sense. Hmm? The list of directories there that are being mounted and new mounted is is, is what explains the, the um, persistent data. Right? So let, they can that... go over that. This here is uh, the jail, so the, the base user land, and it's mounted read only. So if I want to update to a release when it comes out, uh, I stop the jail, I change the configuration, I start the jail again, and it will automatically take a new, destroy the old clone and create a new clone. So instead of basically moving the data around or overwriting data, I just discard old data. Um, Thank you. Um, that's, I, that's there, right? Hmm? So uh, here, for example, and then uh, my user local uh, is just another read-only clone of the installed packages. Uh, the home is local to the jail, and it's a, 
in this example where it's persistent data list, but it could also be somewhere under VARDB. And the important part is basically, instead of using a union file system, I assemble my unions as out of mount points instead of insisting on having a union within a mount point. That makes sense. Yeah. And did you um, have MFS in the mix? Mildly, mind-blowingly? Yes. Okay. So what I had is there, um, so um, I use the um, MFS uh, file system pseudo type uh, because that is handled not directly by the kernel, but through the mount MFS command, which was required once upon a time to create an MD device, put a, a UFS file system on there, and then uh, mount it as async file system. Yeah, the FS tab, uh, sure, why not? Um, okay. And this does, there is some further depth. So, um, yeah, there's a, the something call. I wanted to come to. Go ahead. And one feature the MFS supports, which the normal mounting a tempfs as tempfs does not support, is that if you pass it dash k, you can uh, have it invoke the pex command to uh, basically tar a source directory and untie it into the mount point. So that you can have initial com uh, content copied over, and I use this to get a mfarel slash etc and slash user local etc, which gets then configured and remounted read only, or uh, the mount point is updated. The idea behind is that if I basically do the trivial few changes to the per jail uh, user local etc or slash etc. Uh, on every start, I never have to worry about upgrading between releases and so on, which then breaks this dependency chain. Because if you follow something like the OCI approach with uh, layering tarballs on top of each other with optional uh, write-out files in between, um, the problem is that if some of the lower layers get updated, let's say there's a new patch for FreeBSD, which came out, then all of your... Um, tarballs for the package sets have to be reapplied to that new base. And with my configuration, the base jail, the package set, and its data are completely decoupled. And I can update to a new FreeBSD release. And if the package set is still supposed to be compatible, because let's say I'm upgrading from 13.1 to 13.2, I can just move it over. And it will copy over the TC for, from the currently started a uh, base jail so that I never have to do something like TTC update. And because this is like two megabytes, the memory consumption is negligible. So the mount point is limited to 32 max at worst, but that's just because I didn't feel comfortable lowering it even further. And yeah. Well, keep it coming. Keep, keep your helper strips coming to make this available to we mortals. Um, and then I can have a, a downloader, for example, and drop in, for example, my FreeBSD uh, ISO downloads and stuff uh, into that. Yeah. The, the persistent data bit is interesting to me because that helps. Um, in deploying various things. Yes, it does. But so I don't, I don't understand what you're doing yet. So we'd have to have another session there. I would have to what I'm doing, a, I can pretty explain. Um, so under this just, jail. Let him finish. CFS, Daniel, finish up and then Jan, let him, let, let's see how we can help him and the rest of us. I, I would need to look at an example that you've made public and try and work through it before I could come up with any questions about how things are accomplished because there, there's so much complexity in the jail configuration and in, in how the uh, ZFS map points are, are occurring. I, I, I would need a session just on that. 
Um, I think the most important part is this last command, display z. Mm -hmm. So um, this is basically the root data set for the jail. Yeah. Inside that, I have one sub data set for the base Could for the persistent data. Continue? I'll try to annotate it. Yep. Thank you so much. Uh, I have the base. So let's do the it same for and two. Yeah. Okay. And I should for the base I should probably add the origin as well. Let me do that. Okay. Yeah, update it as appropriate. Um so as you can see here, um the base system is the is cloned from uh so the jails base is mounted here and it gets mounted to uh slash jails name of jail. So it gets mounted here because everything which exists underneath it, it while it may have a mount point assigned so that its child data sets can inherit a mount point prefix, uh, the parent data sets all have a can mount equals off so that they are not to be mounted. Then um, the packages. One level more. Um, again, I create an, a placeholder, which is also unmountable for user local, so that I don't have to assign a mount point to user local. Instead, it inherits this from its parent. And this is the, also uh, just stateless. The stateful part is uh, kind of the uh, most important, but also the most boring part. Um, because here um, I have this uh, parent, which is not to be mounted because can mount equals off. And the others are assigned no auto. I set uh, the can mount to not automatic because I want to clean up whatever may be mounted under the jail root path before I start the jail. And so if I undo any mounts which are there anyway, why have it mounted until the jail is started? Also, it means that you can't accidentally clobber a uh, uh, stop to jail. Yeah. Could you paste those last two or as appropriate as you said? Uh, this one is still important. Uh, did I paste the. Yeah. Include, include the command too. Yeah, please. the command above it, the ZFS command, please. The ZFS list command is relevant. Yes, indeed. Yes. Danke. And the important part, uh, maybe. Uh, so let me put it up. Let's it's say D um, fourteen is your friend, right? Um, to drop. Oh, sorry. Um. Uh, da, 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 da. Um. So let's say I want uh, my download shell to. Da, 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 da. Um. Oh yeah, that is something I could change. So jail.conf, okay, here, yeah, okay. So I will just go here and say, no, I want the extra packages available. And now start my jail again. So let's bring up down the other jails as well to show all of the advantage. Just do a service jail stop. Hmm? Would, no, I would did service, service jail stop do the same uh, thing here? Uh, yes. With the teardown? It just would discard the output. Um, the important part is that uh, I've just uh, switched which uh, package uh, snapshot should be the uh, base. And as you 
I format out here. I remove the out of sync clones. I create new clones. I find that my persistent data already exists. I mount all of it. Uh, this is the uh, TempFS mounting. And then here are the extra stuff. Mm -hmm. to inject DNS configuration into the VNet enabled shell, assign it to WireGuard interfaces, which are configured by the host and then moved over, inject uh, the interface words and so on. And what you've just witnessed here is that I have the jail.conf uh, shell scripting helpers uh, detected that I changed which uh, version of the packages I wanted and it just destroyed the clone and assigned a new one and it started because as you can see here the jail is running. And I can go one further and jail dash um, yeah. Let's say uh, oop. I want to go one release candidate back. I didn't even see the change. Okay, uh, the change is that now I said that I want to include FreeBSD 14.0 uh, release candidate two instead of three as base. Okay, I understand now, thank you. So which is basically the same as switching the patch level. Yeah. And again, it destroyed the base system, took a no new clone, uh, mounted it for a uh, fraction of a second writable to create uh, the mount point directories and made it un uh, read only again. Then, yeah, and now, uh, uh, so you're changing revision and patch level within seconds with your yeah, data preserved. Yes. Got it. And uh, a new slash etc we pop uh, unmounted the old tempfs a new tempfs created the right base versions uh, slash etc copied into the tempfs and then modified. So that I never have to merge again because I'm basically reapplying my patch every time instead of merging the stored result. And is that via a script or said or Ansible or something else? Uh, that's just via the shell scripts. Okay, great. There is no Ansible or any like thing like that. Yep. It's just a bin as H of its prototype. The problem is that uh, it's a bit too tightly coupled. Uh, I need something which looks uh, disturbingly like RC.D. Uh, to make it modular so that you can have one helper to include into every jail.conf to handle the base, one for the packages and one for the persistent data and so on, one for networking so that basically you can reuse this between different services. I can see this being incredibly useful for security-wise testing. Let, let, let's try this patch level, see what happens. Let's try that patch yep. level, see what happens. Yeah, uh, let's try what happens when I change it. Mm -hmm. Just, just even that, I, I, I can see. Yeah, yep. took it up. Because you have the same packages, the same configuration. All you're doing is changing. Yeah, it's bit the... for bit identical user land. Uh, Completely reproducible. Um... Yeah. So for and, bisection, you, know you could go wild even by commit to the tree. Go ahead. Done. Yep. Also useful no, for CI it. or something. Yep. And all of this can be done within a 100 or 200 lines of BinSH, uh, depending on if you count the logging output or not because I spend almost as much co code lines generating 
useful log messages as I spend doing the actual work. And we thank you for it. Yeah. And the other part is that uh, one thing which may not be uh, evident because I just jumped through it far too quickly um, because is this year. Um, All the helper functions are basically they assign which hook you I'm currently in, so that I can use a single log function and can call a function with the right log, log message, so that each of the logging line tells me which stage I'm in right now. And then I uh, register a signal handle uh, both for the int and terminate signals, but also for the fake pseudo signal of exit which is how you do something like at exit in C in a shell script. So if I ever maybe fall out of a script at the end, the cleanup is done because let's say I'm something where else in my script, if I do something like, if I have something like this in here, uh, the cleanup would always run. By stage. So it hmm? By stage, by unique stage. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Exactly. Okay. Uh, and at the end, I then have to uh, restore the default signal handler uh, here for the trap, so that it does not run the cleanup handler after a successful execution, but I leave the uh, interrupt and terminate signal handlers in place because uh, if those happen. They're not supposed to happen, so something went wrong. I don't undo those. Yep. Any questions for Jan? Of the aside, all the hundreds we will have over time. Um, Jan, please keep up the good work. Please uh, package that up and or strip that for the rest of us because uh, there's a lot going on and it's all good stuff. And I'm so glad you've thought about all these issues. So and the important observation I made is that we can have the nice things. We don't need a, a dynamic runtime union FS uh, because the FreeBSD file system hierarchy works out in such a way that basically I don't have to share a single mount point between base packages and uh, persistent data. You can only always untangle this that one directory is only mounted from one of the three. So either a directory contain, contains persistent data or that or the other, it's okay to have persistent data under the base or the packages. And if I destroy the clone, because while they are mounted on top of each other, they are not uh, descendants of each other within ZFS because I split up the ZFS uh, inheritance tree into base packages and data. So I can destroy the cloned snapshots without the data being a child um, ZFS file system of the clone. So I no longer have to untangle this problem that I have to rename the old clone array, create a new clone and move the persistent stuff back. Instead, I can just uh, unmount, destroy the clones, create new clones, mount it all again and it works. Because the data is under its own prefix in the mount, uh, sorry, in the ZFS list tree. So the ZFS name is something like pool, jails, instance of my service, data, and then the data sets containing persistent data. Right. And, and unless so you're as cruel as I was to my pool system and just do a, a ZFS destroy dash uppercase R to have it destroy everything, uh, it won't uh, wipe out um, your persistent data. And if you want to prevent even that, you can put a hold on the, that. If you have a ZFS hold, uh, not even root can destroy uh, something you have a hold on 
uh, without first running ZFS release. That would prevent you from accidentally um, shooting yourself in the foot with ZFS destroy dash R. But the problem is that if you still want the automation to work, now the automation has to invoke ZFS release, which means now it has to uh, disable the safety net. And over, yeah. So one way or the other, um, you have to trust your automation enough to trust it to run ZFS destroy. Only on the clones, but uh, uh, it's still, you have to learn to put trust in your tooling. We are about at about an hour and 45 minutes. Uh, have we ingested enough brilliance? Trust in Jan. That's, that's our new motto now. Repeat that. <laughs> Please but don't. We, we trust in Jan. Trust in it's like a, the Oracle. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, As you just saw, it was only a quick and dirty prototype. Very and quick, it, uh, very dirty. Yes. On demonstration. <laughs> yeah, you got to work on it. Up your game, buddy. Uh, Dan L, any other questions for Jan? No, not here. Okay, everyone, that was a fantastic tour of Elixir and Yon strategies here, and it showcases 3BSD 14. So, uh, Chris, you may want to relay that to you and yours because he's Yon, you're doing God's work, as they say. Okay, any um, final thoughts? Go ahead, Yon. All of the ZFS stuff is already in 13, only that you would have to uh, uh, keep your configuration in a big global jail.conf, but that works. Uh, it's just annoying to maintain by hand. And so the include saves the day there? Yeah, the, it uh, saves you from all the typing out all the duplication saved by it. Yep. On that note. Okay. Right. I have to go. Thank Likewise. you. Guys. Bye. Yes. Thank you. Take care. Uh, let's Cheers. pause there. It's been a fantastic call. I appreciate that. And uh, let's. Uh, some of us can meet tomorrow, but there's also a FreeBSD vendor summit that will keep some of us busy. So, on should I be running? Yeah. If you could drive, that'd be great. I'll drop in if I can. Of course. Awesome. So we are at eleven fifty Pacific. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I will talk to you in some way soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Comment if you have any questions and join us. Join us during during our next call. Thank you, Antonig.